All right, Genesis 37. Jacob lived in the land of his father's travels in the land of Canaan. This is the history of the generations of Jacob. Yosef, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. They give us an age. Hallelujah. 17. Uh, feeding the flocks of his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilha and Zilpha, his father's wives. Yosef brought an evil report of them to their father. Now Yisrael loved Yosef more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a tunic of many colors. His brothers saw that their father looked loved him more than all his brothers and they hated him and couldn't speak peaceably to him uh yeah i mean i uh i'm not a fan of favoritism uh but i i've heard that it's like natural you know you just naturally gravitate towards a certain kid you connect more you but i would like to believe that we should be careful and not like isolating other children, right? Um, not spending time with other children as much and, and things like that. I'm not a big fan of that. I don't think that's justified. Um, but I think it's natural and normal that you connect more with a certain child than others. I can, I can see how personality and whatever it might be, you know. Um, so what do you think, Milo? What do you think, parents? I don't know the voice here, so I think that's me. We're not parents yet. Almost we there. Are. No, we are. Just okay, we are parents. Okay, we are parents. Before the baby is. just hasn't come out yet. <laughs> right, right. We've had this conversation before. I've had I got three kids, and one of them might just click more than the others. You know, but you're right. You got to make sure you're giving all of them attention as well. Don't just shut one out. Yeah. It will. Yes. We'll be bad for the future. I think I think to an extent, right? Um, to an extent, you can't avoid whether a child is going to come out being jealous. You could do the right things. You can spend time with the other kids too, but they're still going to be jealous because they know you connect more with the other one. Yeah. That's that's not. I don't think that's the fault of a parent. As long as the parents doing the best they can to kind of make things fair, and you know. But, right? Like, if I got one child who's more rebellious than another child, then, you know, I'm going to obviously like the other one more because they're not as rebellious. They follow my instructions. They listen to what I have to say. And it just makes my life so much smoother and easier. It's so less stressful. But I still love the other child, and I'm still disciplining the other child. I spend time with them. I do fun things with them. And if that child decides to be jealous because they see how the other child doesn't get in trouble as much and things like that because the other child obeys, that's not my, it's not my fault as a parent that that child gets jealous, you know? So we have to instruct that child to rid themselves of that jealousy and that flesh, you know, things like that. What do you think, Jeremy and Monty, you guys, I'm asking now for y'all to participate and give me some parenting experience here on your, on your part so far. What do you think about favoritism? And uh, how, does that, how does that manifest in your family? If, if it does or not. Can you hear me okay? Um, well, we have... For those that don't know, we have four and one on the way. Yeah. And our oldest, or our, the ages range from um, eight to two. Our youngest being two. So um, when it comes to favoritism, I think it's a temptation that you, that I was confronted with as a parent, you know, to want to provoke your child you know if your child's being honoring it's one of those things like i wasn't going to get dessert tonight but since you wanted to act like a fool i feel like getting dessert and making you not have none so you can you can feel that that not having you know but through doing that it's like 
the father starts showing me my heart as a parent and showing me how I can be right but handle something wrong, you know? So back to favoritism comes to it. I'm confronted with wanting to show favoritism, but I have to maintain a balance, make sure that it's fair across the board. And if my child starts to become jealous because one child is listening and ends up getting a reward because that's just what the reward was for the day, then it's important that I explain it to the one that's feeling left out. Don't just let him be jealous and walk away like hey, he feels how he feels. No, I have to then go to that one and comfort him, but allowing him to understand you could have had this reward too. Don't let your focus be on frustrated at your sibling and more as frustrated with, with disobedience, you know? Yeah. I think about Ken and Abel, but I don't want to go too far off. <laughs> off topic. No, that's good. You have anything? That's good. I like it. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, definitely teach. Don't let the kid go off with his jealousy feelings and let his mind wander, right? It's important for us to teach. That's our role as parents, teach, educate. And what they do with that is on them, right? I mean, you would hope, we hope and pray that they receive what you're teaching them and they learn the lessons so that they could get the reward and see that they are, they are equal, you know? All right, that's good stuff, man. I like it. Ezzy. I was just gonna say, I don't see anything wrong with having favor over a child as long as you're not um, treating the other children, you know, differently because of it. Because, you know, even Jacob favored Rachel over Leah because she was prettier to him or more attractive. Um, but he still treated them the same as we can see from scripture. So I don't see anything wrong with favoring um, favoring a, a child. Huh? That's actually incorrect. Milo, Milo said that's not, uh, he actually did treat them differently. He did? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's where, that's where I think the favor can become an issue because even Yahuwah favored some, he favored Abraham, he favored Moshe, he favors people who, you know, are able to build the kingdom or contribute to the kingdom. So if I had multiple children, I only have one, but if I had a son, of course, my, my firstborn Joshua, I'm going to favor him a little bit more in his training and development and certain things that he has over my other children, because number one, he's a firstborn, but through him, hopefully he can lead the others. So I don't see anything wrong with favor as long as you're not compromising on the treatment of the other children. Right. I think, I think favoritism is okay as long as, I mean, this is just me speaking from little experience. You know, I've worked with kids. I was a social worker for seven years, working with kids from the ages of five to 19 years old. Uh, but I think that the favoritism shouldn't cause you to, like, um, show more mercy to one kid than the other. Like if like they both did something wrong, you don't let one get the consequence, but you let the other one get the consequence. You know what I'm saying? Like that's when I think favoritism starts becoming compromised. But if deep down in your heart, one is more obedient, I just, me personally, I just think as a parent, I think as a friend, I think as a leader, even me as a leader, I favor people who are more submissive, who, who are more wise, who show wisdom, who, who, who are, you know, good with scripture, who teach me things, who know how to correct me, right? My wife. Um, so, you, you know, I, <laughs> yeah, I better be your favorite. Uh, I naturally, my heart, my heart, like, you know, my heart gravitates towards that, but I don't want to compromise in letting them get, a, letting my wife get away with sin, right? Just because she's my wife and just because she's my favorite. Right, that's that's where I think the parenting favoritism stuff goes wrong. I think we're talking about partiality. That's oh, Milo's Milo's saying we're talking about two different things: yes, favoritism and partiality. That's good. Weird. That's a good point. There's a two different words there in scripture, Jeremy. I had a question, and that was perfect. I wanted. 
to understand when you say favoritism and saying that it's okay to favor, have favoritism towards a child, what does that look like? Because, it, um, yeah, just what does it look like? What does it mean to have favoritism without partiality? Hmm. I know when for I, me. When I'm, talk, um, when I'm talking about it, I'm thinking more an internal feeling about the, about the person. I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. I, I would need to chew on that for a little bit. What does it physically look like? But I know when I'm thinking about it, it's internally how I feel. Like I, I have joy teaching this child. I have joy giving this kid rewards. Like it's, it's, I have joy venturing onto something new with this child because he has a record and a reputation of just either getting it quick or understanding things better and following through on things. So I have joy, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I think there's an internal feeling uh, versus another child might be like, all right, what, what's going to happen today? You know what I mean? We're going to, we're giving it a shot again. We're doing something new. I hope he's good today, you know, type of thing, you know? So I would, I would favor in turn, but yeah, Ezzy, what you got? I was going to use the example of, um, you know, a father having a son and a daughter, right? A, a man is naturally probably going to have more favor with his son. There's more things that you can relate on. You take him out hunting. There's certain things that you're going to be teaching him and spending more time that may seem like, you know, you're showing a little bit more favor or favoritism because you're able to relate more with your son over your daughter. But that doesn't mean that you're going to neglect your daughter now and not, you know, take her on certain things, certain outings or spend certain time with her to also culture and uh, uh, to also nurture and cultivate certain characteristics in your daughter. But a man may naturally have more favor with his sons over his daughters just because of, you know, the relatability and your role as a man raising a, a future man. That would be an easy example for me to pull. Nice. Milo, anything? Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 17. It says, you shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not be afraid to face, uh, you shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's. The case that is too hard for you, you shall bring to me and I will hear it. So I think talking about Moses. Uh, Deuteronomy 16, 19, you shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. You shall not take a bribe for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. So go ahead. Okay. So this is because you had mentioned that in regards to the feeling and then you kind of expressed this, you would have more joy around the kid that's maybe more like you mm -hmm. or just, just easier to kind of venture with. Yeah. So I have a live example. I'm not going to say who, but I know of a family where there is a son and daughter. The son is a firstborn and the, you know, then the, then came the daughter, but the son is just like the mom mm -hmm. and the daughter is just like the father. Right. And literally the father did not know how to handle that. Mm -hmm. So he would say things to the son, like you need to be more like your sister. Mm. Right. And what he was trying to say was, you need to be more like me because mm -hmm. he saw himself in the daughter. Right. So for the son, it's your, your favorite between us is your daughter. Yeah. Not only are you expressing that verbally, but you're expressing that naturally because she's naturally like you. She, she's just going to go do things with you and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think where this becomes dangerous <coughs> is when that expression of joy, because that child is like you, is very noticeable. And I think... What, what parents, what I've yeah. seen parents not learn how to do. Wearing it on your sleeve. Exactly. And not learning how to do is be able yeah, to true. mold to each child. Mm -hmm. Because every child is different. Yes. Yeah. You like to, well, do you love to have a little mini me sometimes? We yeah. want all no. children to be the same as far as submission, obedience, mm -hmm. uh, respect. But understanding that children are different in the sense of personality, personality temperament, exactly. uh, things like that. And so I think there's a way to cultivate that. You know, that, that, that father-son relationship, skills. yeah, that father-son relationship could have been cultivated way better yeah. if the father would have accepted that personality that the right. son had, even, even if the daughter was quote unquote the favorite, right. but still being able to bring up the best in, in the son 
One kid like liked that. to go out more and play outside. One kid liked to be inside more, things like that. Mm-hmm. Like, and so one is louder. The other one's more introverted. Exactly. One is more outgoing. Those are all things that I don't think is, yeah, I agree. Like, yeah, I think it's dangerous to be like, you need to be more like your sibling mm-hmm. because that would encompass in their mind, oh, you want me to be like them totally, like mm-hmm. to be pers- like their personality, to act like them, be like mm-hmm. them. They're not isolating in their mind that dad and mom is actually talking about, they want me to be more obedient. They want me to be more mm-hmm. submissive. They want me to be, Perfect. so it's our job as parents to clarify and to, or just focus on, I want you to be more obedient rather than say, I want you to be more like your sister. Just say, I, I would like for you to be more obedient. Yeah, and I believe you have to tell her. I think as a parent, you as much as we, it's easier to deal with ones that we understand like ourselves, right? Because we yeah. understand our thinking. But just naturally, I would, I would think you have you have to stretch yourself as a parent. You you have to you have to be able to have the ability to to mend and mold to the different child's ways of learning and, and thinking and processes and stuff. So <clears throat> so there's this mix between the partiality, favoritism. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very, I think it could be a very dangerous slope, especially when you start seeing like in this and this and this, these verses, you see where the brothers hate their brother. Mm-hmm. It's, and, and I don't think it's just a matter of that because they're jealous. It's because they notice their father is very different. And it's like, like you gave him a whole tunic to himself. Like, you know, I was going to ask, my question was going to be, do you think Jacob was favoring or was it partiality? If there is a difference between the two words. I think partiality. Everyone should have got a robe or a gift, something. So that way there is no uh, conflict. And, and what do you that's, think, Milo? That's funny because I disagree. I think that's, I would say because because right beforehand it talks about how Yaakov tattletailed on his brothers, right? When they did an evil report. So, I mean, not Yaakov, Yosef. Um, I think... <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I wish we had more. It's my little watchdog. I my little watchdog. He sees yeah, everything. Yeah, he reports yeah, everything. He does to report. Me. He does report. I I need I, that. I wish we had more um, inside look on how he treated the other brothers. I right. I'm assuming because that's part of it, right? But then I picture you know like when my mom gives me something and not my brother, but he doesn't get offended because I know my brother's gonna get something later on. It's just you know. Here's the question. I don't know. Here's the, the, the definition so in the birth. The definition is in the passage, Genesis 37, mm-hmm. verse, verse 3. Now, Yisrael loved Yosef more than all of his children. Mm-hmm. Talking about love here. Mm-hmm. Should we be loving all of our children equally? Or is it natural and okay to love one more than the others? You know what my mom says to us? My mom would say this. She says, I love you equally but differently. Mm. That, that's, yes, that's I how, like that. And and it's because we, my brother and I, have a different relationship with my mom, mm-hmm. right? Obviously, but um, but that is her phrase that she's always kept throughout the years. I love you yeah. equally, but differently. Now, I think one of I, I can get on my mom's nerves sometimes and might lose some of that love. She won't say that, but, <laughs> but, but I, yeah. Here, I, I'm. Hmm. This is that. This is a good. This is a good. This is a good discussion. Um. Me, I think that it's appropriate to love one more than the other based upon their obedience. You know, by their fruits, like yeah, like I'm thinking of as God, Yahuwah, and His children. That's how I relate. That's how I'd like to relate my position as a parent. Right, is to Yahuwah and Israel. Right, so. Genesis 37, verse 3, it says, Yisrael loved Yosef more than his children because he was the son of his old age. It, it doesn't, yeah, it's not, to me, that's not a good reason. I, I think it's a compromising favorit, uh, favoritism that's going on here. I think, it was, I think it was a flaw. Jacob wasn't perfect, right? I think this was... This wasn't a pure favoritism. So perhaps there's a little responsibility on Yaakov's part of why the other children were jealous of Yosef. And I'm going to entertain, I would like to entertain, I know it doesn't say, this is my part of my assumption, 
Yosef was the firstborn of Rachel, which is the one he loved most. Okay. Now, when we went back and we read about how you, um, Yaakov set up the, the camps to go to Esau, what he did was he put the, the concubines first with their, with their sons. Mm -hmm. Then he put Leah. And the last one he put was Rachel and, and, and uh, Yosef, almost as in protection, like, the, the, the best one can kind of get saved last. That, that's my little assumption. Whenever I read that story, that's how I picture it. So part of me also thinks because this is the son of Rachel, the, the wife that he really loves, he had more love towards this one. That, that's my, my own personal, personal doesn't, assumption. Doesn't uh, the, the Gospels talk about Yahusha and Yahonan, how he laid his head on Yahusha's chest on bosom. his bosom mm -hmm. like i would say the disciple he loved the disciple he loved i mean there's like language that shows that even yahusha loved certain disciples probably a little a little differently some more than the others anyway something to uh hmm. something to you know continue to look into but I would say this, I, at first I was reading this and I, w I thought that Jacob's favoritism was okay and justified, but c after discussing and talking about it, I'm actually thinking that it was a little f flawed. There were, some <clears throat> there were some cracks in. Uh... I think Amani and D-Rail wanted to say something. Go ahead. No, okay, D-Rail no, all right. Thanks for checking though. Um, <clears throat> All right, let's keep going, let's go. So he made them a tunic, didn't make the other ones a tunic. I hear you, Ezzy, I hear you. Um, uh, verse four, his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and they hated him and couldn't speak peaceably to him, okay? So, yeah. Verse five, Yosef dreamed the dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him all the more. He said to them, please hear this dream, which I have dreamed. For behold, we were, we were binding sheaves in the field and behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheep came around and bowed down to my sheep. I'd be mad too if I was hearing something like that from a sibling. Like, boy, don't be coming over here sharing stories like that. I mean, keep that stuff to yourself, bro. <laughs> verse 8 his brothers asked him will you indeed reign over us will you indeed have dominion over us they hated him all the more for his dreams and his words he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brothers and said behold I have dreamed yet another dream and behold the sun and the moon and eleven stars bowed down to me 11 stars, he's got 11 brothers. He told it to his father and to his brothers. His father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Will I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves down to the earth before you? So, wow, the dream, we, oh, I missed that part. I missed that part. It's not just the stars, but the, the sun and the moon represent mommy and daddy. Yeah. Um, verse 11. His brothers envied him, but his father kept this saying in mind. He kept it in mind. He rebuked them, but he's like, huh, oh, I'm not forgetting about this. Keep it in the back of my mind. His brothers envied him. Verse 12. His brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Israel said to Yosef, aren't your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come and I will send you to them. He said to him, here I am. He said to him, go now, see whether it is well with your brothers and well with the flock and bring me more, bring me word again. Yeah, his little messengers, my little mini me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. A certain man found him and behold, he was wandering in the field. The man asked him, what are you looking for? He said, I am looking for my brothers. Tell me, please, where they are feeding the flock. The man said, they have left here 
for I heard them say, let's go to Dathan. Yosef went after his brothers and found them in Dathan. They saw him far off, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. Verse 19. This almost sounds like Yahusha and the Pharisees. That's kind of what it sounds like. Here's my son, my favorite. Listen to everything he says. Pharisees are like, what? I ain't listening to this guy. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Uh, Joshua, got a question or scripture? No, I got a question. Uh, I wanted to go back a little bit to 10. Uh, okay. I didn't understand that because it says, shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come down to bow down to the earth. I was wondering why he's mentioning the mother coming down and bowing down when his mother's already passed. Ooh, that's a good catch. I have, I have no idea. I have no idea what that's about. <laughs> that is a good catch. Wow. Hmm. Maybe in the resurrection? Maybe they think about the resurrection? Maybe they have a concept of the afterlife? Or uh, he still, like, she still, like, he still represents her? Like, that's still, I don't know. That's a good one, bro. You got me on that one. No idea, man. <laughs> wow. Is there a is there is there a new mother in the picture? You can't have a mother. You can't have a new mother, but I'm saying, oh, there's still the other wife, though. I was gonna say the children all have mothers. The brothers, you know, they have their mothers. We still got the other mothers left. My bad. We got we got we got Leah. Rachel died. It does say your mother. Milo's correct. She's like, it does say your mother, though, which sounds specific. And his mother's dead. All right, look, man, that's a good one, Joshua. I'm going to have to, I don't know, man. I'm going to do looks on Google for that, man. I've got to search for that one. <laughs> wow. Okay. Conspiracy session 101. Here we go. All right. Verse 18. Let's keep going. If anybody has an answer for that on YouTube or anything, email me, devoted to ya at gmail.com, okay? <laughs> say what you got to say. Verse uh, 9, so 18, they conspired. They saw him far away, and before he came near, they conspired against him to kill him. Verse 19, they said to one another, Behold, this dreamer comes. Come now, therefore, and let's kill him and cast him into one of the pits, and we will say, An evil animal has devoured him. We will see what will come, what will become of his dream. Reuben heard it and delivered him out of their hand and said, let's not take his life. Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him that he might deliver him out of their hand to restore him to his father. What's, uh, what's 22? Can you, can you somebody give me what they're hearing from verse 22. Milo. Yeah. Reuben's saying, don't kill him. Don't kill him. Um, we'll throw him into the pit. Throw him in the pit. Let him stay alive. Because Reuben's plan is to come back later and just get him from the pit. Reuben's plan is to come rescue him. All right, that's what I thought I was reading. Mm. <laughs> He's got his own little right, plans. Yeah. And then wouldn't that allow favor from their father? Wouldn't that gain favor to bring the son back? For Reuben, yeah. I think I'm going to go, ooh, this is my chance to get a little higher in ranking, get some points on the, get some more stars on the chart. I'm going to have a star chart, y'all, with my kids. I'm going to have a reward chart, okay? It's going to be all over the house. Look at so-and-so. He's got 10 stars and you only have two. <laughs> 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 Reel them in, Milo. Reel them in. Reel them in. <laughs> Get your game up. Where are your stars at? I like the star idea. Though. I love it. Reward chart. Well, first of all, Ruben nice. did sleep with the father's wife. One, you know. Oh wife, yeah, he's so. that shiesty one. Yeah. Oh man. All right. What are the intentions? Yeah. What are the intentions with Ruben? Right. What's the intentions of his heart? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
it's wrong to put your kid in the pit. I mean, that's to, to put your brother yeah, in the pit. I mean, you're, that's just all right. There's no good intention here. But it, but in all honesty, it's, I guess it's just trying to think on the feet. Like, let's not actually kill him. Mm -hmm. I'll give him that. He I'll said, give him he that. Says like, you know, I hate you, but let's not. Let's not, let's not kill you. Let's not yeah. shed blood. That's not, not something that to play far. with. Yeah, yeah, that's not something to play with, right? Verse twenty three. When ya, when Yosef came to his brothers, they stripped Yosef of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. They sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. Yehuda said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not let our hand be on him. Ooh. He is our brother, our flesh. His Ooh. brothers and his brothers listened to him. d -Rev. Okay. Judas said this, right? Let's sell him, or Yehuda, whatever. That reminds me of what happened with Yahusha. Judas pretty much sold his Messiah for silver. Mm. I see a link. Mm. Mm. I like it. Prophetic, a prophetic picture here of the gospel. Same name too. Wow. And I love, and I love somebody in our previous fellowship showed us, I forgot what book it is, one of the quote unquote minor prophets. I don't like saying minor prophets, that's but in one of the prophets, it says Yahuwah says that you will deliver me or betray me for 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 whatever the pieces of coins or silver it is. I forgot which passage that is, if anybody wants to find it, but Yahuwah says, you will do that to me. And it actually happens to Yahusha, further proving that Yahusha is definitely Yahuwah. Uh, Jeff. Um, there's a lot of type and shadow things happening between Joseph and Yahusha. There's actually a, a lot of lists you can actually look up now because people have made this connection before. Yep. And there's many, many connections that, that would seem to point to Yahusha. From, from the life of Joseph. Absolutely. I see another thing uh, with the brothers. Uh, Reuben, he wants like favoritism. Judas is greedy. Um, what was the, was there another brother? This is the two I've heard so far. What, the Reuben? Reuben, Reuben he, he hit, his thing is like he wants favoritism, obviously, because he had a plan to mm -hmm. save his brother even though he was part of the plot. It's kind of like he wants favoritism from his father. Yeah. He's greedy. He wants money. He's like, wait a minute, we can get his money. What, you know, if we slay him, we're not going to get paid. You know, let's, let's do something so we get some money. You know, he's after that, you know, silver. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Yeah. Uh, Ezzy. The passage you were talking about is Zechariah 11, um, 12 to 13. About the uh, uh, and I and I said to them, if it is good, oh wait, wait, uh, yeah, and I said to them, if it is good in your eyes, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages thirty pieces of silver, and Yahuwah said to me, throw it to the potter, the splendid price at which I was valued by them, and I took the thirty pieces of silver, silver, and threw them into the house of Yahuwah for the potter. Thank you. Very revealing. Love it. Genesis 37, verse 28. Midianites, who, who were merchants, passed by, and they drew and lifted up Yosef out of the pit and sold Yosef to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. The merchants brought Yosef into Egypt. So verse 27, come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not let our hand be on him, for he is our brother, our flesh. But Midianites came, who were merchants, passed by, and they drew and lifted Yosef. It sounds like the Midianites got to him before the brothers did. The Midianites got there first, and they sold him to Ishmaelites. Am I reading that right or wrong? 
I still think if I was getting sent to Midianites, and it was just between Adele. Okay. Yeah. That's the story I recall how it went, but it kind of looks different the way I'm reading it. All right. Verse 29. Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Yosef wasn't in the pit. You see, it sounds like it's a surprise. They were expecting to go there. Unless they did it behind Reuben's back. Is yes. that the story? They did that it behind Reuben's back. All right, all right. I guess you can see it that way. Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Yosef wasn't in the pit, and he tore his clothes. He returned to his brothers and said, the children is no more, and I, the child is no more, and I, where will I go? They took Yosef's tunic and killed a male goat and dipped the tunic in blood. They took the tunic of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, we have found this. Examine it now and see if it is your son's tunic or not. He recognized it and said, it is my son's tunic. An evil animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn in pieces. Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son many days. I just want to make a little side note. Culturally, it seemed like, there you go, rendering your garments was a sign of mourning, grieving. We'll see that. You can see that throughout scripture. You see it in the prophets. You see in Joel chapter 2 where Yahuwah says in the last days, you know, um, or he's saying gather a, a, a solemn assembly. Call a fast and a prayer, right? Gather all the elders and the, and the priests. Let them weep between the porch and the altar. Let them rend their hearts and not their garments. So you see uh, that kind of uh, language. But uh, so he tore his clothes. And then when Yahusha is crucified, the, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. As if, you know, that's how that... Instead of a human doing it, a human, if a human did it, it would have ripped from the bottom to the top because it's big, it's high, right? But it ripped from the top down. It's almost like Yahuwah rendered his garment. Um, 34. Verse 34, Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him but he refused to be comforted. He said, for I will go down to Sheol, to my son, mourning. His father wept for him. The Midianites sold him into Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. I'm sure we could do a lesson on Sheol out of this. <laughs> What is Sheol? What is the concept that the Hebrews had of Sheol? We got different people giving different interpretations of what they think Sheol is. Some people say Sheol is just a place of the dead. There's no, there's no uh, interaction going on down there. There's no, you're absolutely dead. There's nothing going on. It's completely dark, black, and you're waiting to be resurrected. <coughs> um, we have other places in scripture where uh, there, there's a, like Yahusha in the New Testament talks about uh, Sheol, or he calls it the bosom of Abraham. And there's actually interaction going on down there between the wicked and the righteous. So I actually believe that there is, your spirit is alive. I believe that after death, your spirit is awake and we're waiting for the resurrection. That's what I believe. Um, I'm, I'm in agreeing. I, I believe more with like the example of the story that Yahushua gave. You got people that are wicked, that are waiting to be condemned, that are hot, not fully burning, not fully being tortured like they will be when they're thrown into the lake of fire. But it's definitely hot. It's It's... Like not comfortable, and while the righteous who are dead are actually, you know, in more peace, waiting for the resurrection. There isn't there isn't no redemptive. It's not like the Catholics say that you know in um, purgatory 
and then you have a chance in purgatory to repent of your ways and be saved. I don't, I don't believe in that. I only believe that that happened once <coughs> after Yahushua died. It says he went down and preached to many who were in. Yeah, that was Matthew, actually. I think I was reading that this week. And then those souls came up and preached with him in the cities. So, so yeah, it's very interesting. But yeah, I don't have an extensive uh, lesson on Sheol right now in front of me. Genesis 42, verse 38 says, he said, my son shall not go down with you for his brother is dead and he only is left. If harm happens to him along the way in which you go, then you will bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. Genesis 44, 29. If you take this one also from me and harm happens to him, you will bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. If, if Sheol was a place where you just stop, you cease to exist and there's nothing going on, then you can't be sorrowful in Sheol. There is no feelings. That's just my immediate thought right now reading this passage. I'll read one more and then I'll let Ezzy go. Genesis 44, 31, it will happen when he sees that the boy is no more, that he will die. Your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. Ezzy. It's not about Sheol. I was just going to say that um, for me, this, this passage really solidifies that we can really put certain curses, habits, and sin on our children. Because you see where um, uh, Yaakov, you know, has, has, I mean, for the, until he made peace with Esau, there's been a lot of deception and deceit, even with his children. Um, and now you have these other sons, the brothers of Yosef, are now trying to deceive their father once again with, um, you know, Reuben trying to rescue him after they're the ones that put him in the pit. And now they've dipped his robe in blood, you know, to make it seem, there's just a lot of deception that's going on. Um, and I know in raising my son, there's certain things that I see in him that I have struggled with. So it's like, oh, you, you really have to be like raising children is it's, it, it really helps you understand Yahuwah's wrath, his love. <clears throat> I mean, just, everything um so I, I, and something else that i see is that i feel like uh Jacob's household is kind of running amok like he's not really it's a little dysfunctional. Okay. It's a little dysfunctional. yes very very dysfunctional i mean for him to what stood out to me was in verse 10 when it says that he rebuked yosef for sharing the dream but then kept what how did how did they word it that he kept it in his mind where where is it um uh i don't even see it <sighs> da, 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 what is <laughs> oh it says in verse 11 and his brothers envied him but his father guarded the word so here you are you're rebuking in front of the brothers as if he did something wrong which would further fuel you know the brothers but then you're guarding the word why would you not show that in front of your house you know in front of your your children yeah. um but but then also when you i don't have siblings i don't have um um full siblings like I didn't grow I was a single child but you if you're raising multiple children you see their interaction with each other so mm -hmm. I'm sure Yaakov would see that the brothers are treating Joseph differently there's some discord I'm just I'm just appalled at how he is not in control of his household yeah 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 there's definitely some dysfunction there um yeah the last thing I was going to say or ask is um, I've always known the, the robe of Joseph to be a colorful robe. I know that's what they say in Christianity, but in my translation, it doesn't talk about any colors. It just says a robe. So where did this color com concept come from? And is it spoken about somewhere else other than this passage? Let's see. Where is the, uh, where is the first time that's mentioned up top, right? Yep. Uh, verse three. 
Let's see here. The word for colors in the King James is pas, H sixty four four six, which means flat of the hand or foot, palm, sole of the tunic reaching the palms and soles. Hmm. I don't see colors in here. The origin is 6461, which means to disappear, vanish, cease, fail, to vanish. I don't see the connection with colors. That could be definitely an uh, insert of, uh, of man there. I don't see the connection either when I'm looking into the definition. So you might have a good translation there. What translation are you reading? Hallelujah scriptures. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. What did yours, what did the H number say? Uh, H6446. It means flat of the hand or foot. Um, a tunic reaching to the palms and soles. I give you the Greek. Uh, there is no Greek. I got the Greek right here. Oh, the Septuagint. Yeah. What is it? What do you have there? Uh, G four one six four. Poikilos of uncertain derivation, motley that is various in character, divers manifold. Maybe it's a uh, different animal skins. So yeah, maybe different. Uh, different. Yeah, different. Uh, uh, Cloths or whatever. Yeah. Material. Could be that. And they just said color. Not that, and not that it's wrong to have clothes of different materials. Some people in the Messianic Hebrew roots, they get carried away with one of the Torahs that says, you know, you shall not mix garments. But that particular passage is talking about specific uh, material, wool and linen. You're not supposed to mix wool and linen. Wear clothes that has wool and linen on it. It's not saying you can't have a combination of other things. Um, but uh because one passage says don't mix the the material but there's another passage talking about that command that actually specifies it and that's how you bring harmony to the two um but yeah so it could be according to subject but yeah colors i don't see colors yeah it's actually not colors but i think it's a different materials yeah all right Interesting. english translated as colors mm -hmm. amani The interlinear says that he made a robe reaching to the feet. A robe reaching to the feet. Makes sense? Yeah, it makes sense for your Hebrew number. Yeah, with the Hebrew number, the definition, yeah. Cool. So King James and threw in colors. <laughs> yeah, they threw in colors, man. Colors, colors. <laughs> they like throwing in stuff. All right, y'all. Well, that's all we got. Very good. Good, good chat. Good, uh, good reading. That was uh, Genesis 37.